right here. Uh, neurotransmitters do not reproduce. They kind of just float around in your brain as damaged cells. And so that's why that it's a risk factor of early warning signs when it comes to some type of mental condition or mental, um, mental illness. People who are exposed to adverse child events or including abuse, neglect, divorce, or witnessing domestic violence, drug abuse, that's also a, ri a, a risk factor for early warning signs. And of course, lifestyle, uh, we talk about, we can say substance use uh, can increase chances of developing mental illness and having a mental illness also can increase the risk of, of using some type of substance abuse. Now, I, I wanna stay right here for, for one moment when we talk about some of these risk factors and I wanna use myself as a case study. And so I wanna kind of bring this case study in. Usually in my classes, we always, we will have a case study where we can pretty much align what we're talking about to a real live case study uh, in my, uh, my regular classes that I teach uh, throughout the week. So, so I'm gonna use myself as a, as a case study when it comes to a mental condition. And this is, this is a real case, so, so bear with me. Um, during the COVID, um, I actually developed a, uh, uh, a biological uh, condition that actually affected my physical body. Um, and, and we all know that we talked about the anxiety that everyone experienced. And, and at this particular time, uh, I think you, just like myself, wanted to do everything to, to, to avoid uh, the virus. We did all we could, okay? And one of the things I was doing, I was taking supplements to try to make sure that I kept myself, um, uh, my, my immune system built up. Um, and so I was taking, and so I know I have some nurses out there but I was taking, and you know what I'm talking about, I was taking B12, I was taking a B complex, which is a combination of all of the B vitamins. I also was taking a multivitamin, uh, which had uh, B12 and some other Bs in it. I was taking a biotin um, and, and other, other supplements, vitamin C. And so basically what began to happen, and I was not paying attention, I was actually taking too much, but I wasn't thinking about taking too much, I was more so thinking about, I should, I, I wanna make sure that I take enough supplements so that I don't wanna get this virus. So what basically happened was the whole side of my left face began to become deformed. And I noticed it, I, you know, as I would get up in the morning, get myself together to, to get into the virtual environment to teach, I noticed some strange things was happening to the left side of my face. Um, but I didn't pay attention to it. I said, oh, I'll be all right. Taking all these vitamins, you know, I'm, I'm going to be fine. And day by day, it got worse and worse. And I wasn't paying attention to the early warning signs. And I kept taking the B complex, the B12, the biotin, the, the multivitamin. I kept taking all of that until one day I couldn't open up the side of my, this side of my mouth, the left side. My eye never closed. Even when I tried to go to sleep, it was half closed. Um, this side of my face was always in pain. Now I'm having now just persistent consistent pain. At first it was just a headache and I thought, oh, I'll just take some Tylenol or I'll just take some Aleve and I'll get rid of the pain in my head. Now I was taking the Tylenol and nothing was going away. Okay. And so this side of my face began to become more and more and more abnormal. So much so that even a student made a comment in the virtual environment, professor, are you okay? In the chat box. And I said, yeah, I'm going to be okay. I you know, I think you know, I'm probably going to see a doctor. And so once that happened, once I heard from a student, I said to my husband, you know, I, think, I think I need to go see a doctor. And with COVID, I said, well, I don't know if I want to go to an emergency room because I don't want to catch COVID. I, I think I'll just handle it myself. Okay. And, and so, so moving right along, fast forward, we, we did get to the emergency room. 
And again, not just not not looking at the early warning signs, this whole side of my face had just become literally just de deformed. So much so that I couldn't even talk straight. I was talking with almost, I almost, it almost looked like I was having a stroke. And so I began to pray. I said, oh God, you know, I don't know what's happening. I, I thought I was doing the right thing. Okay. Um, and so, so I began to pray more. I said, well, I'm going here. I don't, I want to get in and out of there. I said, Lord, let me, I want to, you know, teaching these classes about cultural confidence. I said, I want somebody who's confident. So I literally prayed, I said, God, give me an African-American doctor. Um, and, and he answered that prayer. And, and so the doctor had diagnosed that I was actually taking too much B12 and that I should stop it immediately. Not only did I, I go to the emergency room, but I also reached out to my primary care doctor. And I says, I think I'm having a stroke. And she says, well, if you're having a stroke, you need to get to the emergency room right away. And so she followed, she made a follow-up call to me to make sure I was okay. As soon as I got out of the class, my husband got home, we went straight to the emergency room and they had to actually give me a steroid to straighten out this side of my face because I ignored, I ignored the early warning signs. And so, so just keep that case study in mind as we go forward. Risk factors and early warning signs is critical when it comes to your mental health. And having a combination of the three of the four uh, risk factors here, genes, biological and environmental and lifestyle, is an indication that someone might be showing some signs of some type of mental health condition, okay? And I was mentally, I thought I was doing the right thing. And I, you know, felt like, yeah, I'm, I'm, a, I'm gonna be okay. And I felt like I didn't need to reach out to anyone. And yes, I was taking those supplements for a few months, maybe four, five, six, six months, and not realizing that I was doing damage to, to my insides. So, so we have to be aware of, of these symptoms when they last longer than a few weeks when it comes to our mental health. Um, and when they last longer than a few weeks, it begins to affect our daily uh, responsibilities. It can affect us in school. It can affect us at work. It will affect our relationships. Um, and anything that lasts more than two months, you need to reach out for help. We need to reach out for help. We need to address the symptoms early, um, identify the underlying illness, and plan an appropriate course of action. Okay, and so in my case, um, it, it was a while that that I, I just I, I just let it go. I just felt like I'm going to be okay uh, without reaching out for help. Let's these here, when we talk about a mental illness or a mental condition, and we had talked about this uh, in our first session, how do you know when a person is having a, a mental condition or a mental, or there's a mental illness? Well, there are stages, and these are the four stages. Number one, the, and, I, and I'm not going to read these through it, but I'm going to make sure um, if those of you who would like to get this, you, you can have a copy of this. But stage one are mild symptoms and warning signs. In other words, if, if, you're, if a person is at stage one, they know they sense something is wrong. Something is not right. Okay. And, and those are just mild systems. You, you still can function. You still can go to work. Um, you still can get up in the morning. And, and, and for my situation, I was at a stage one. I knew something wasn't right, but um, I just ignored the warning signs. Stage two, symptoms increase in frequency and severity and interfere with life's activities and roles, okay? And so in my case, again, I wasn't thinking. I felt like I thought I was doing the right thing. I kept on taking all those Bs and all those supplements. And now it's now starting to interfere. It's starting to this thing started happening to, to my face, but I still was able to get to work. I was still was able to function in a home, okay? 
started getting headaches. Um, it became obvious now that something was wrong at stage two um, because I, my whole face started to just twist in abnormal ways. Stage three, symptoms worsen with relapsing and reoccurring episodes accompanied by serious disruptions of life activities and roles. And I don't think I really got to stage three. I think it was at stage two where I said that I need to go and, and get this thing straightened out. I'm not sure what's happening. Um, I need to go get it straightened out. I reached out again to my doctors and it was a doctor that said, well, what are you taking? And when I told her what I was taking, she immediately said, well, that will do it. Uh, if you're taking too much bees, that certainly can cause some side effects. Um, and of course, when I went to the emergency room, the doctor was able to diagnose the same thing. So stage four, um, this is where the person cannot function anymore. When it comes to a mental illness, there's impairment. Um, the condition can cause a crisis in the person's life. There is extreme prolonged persistence symptoms of impairment. The person can lose their job. They become hospitalized. Some people uh, can become homeless. Uh, worst case scenarios, uh, mental illnesses can also lead to a loss of life the average of 25 years earlier if a person is at stage four. Stage four, the person may need uh, to go now to some type of psychiatric uh, facility in order to help to stabilize or help that person with their mental. And at this point, at stage four, it becomes a mental illness. Okay. So, so, so how do we help someone dealing with a mental illness? Um, and this is another question that had come up. Um, how, how do we help someone if they are at the stages, maybe uh, if they are at a stage four and they have not come to the realization um, that they do have some type of something is going on, something is wrong. They don't reach out for help. They don't reach out to their PCP. They don't reach out to a loved one. How do we help someone who has now reached stage four um, as relates to mental illness? If your loved one is showing any signs of a mental condition, um, have an honest conversation with them about their concerns. Talk to them about it. You may not be able to force uh, someone to get professional help if they're in denial, okay? I was actually in denial for a while until I, I could not uh, uh, withstand the pain that I had in, in my head until I really, the, the twistedness of the, the left side of my face was, was obvious. Um, I, I started talking to, I I started talking to my husband and I called my doctor. Something is going wrong. Something is not right here. And then, of course, I found myself in the emergency room. You can offer encouragement and support to that person who might be in denial. But remember that we cannot force anyone uh, to go for professional care. They have to be able to come to themselves and say, I need help. You, you can also help your loved one by finding a qualified mental health professional. You can help them by making an appointment. Uh, once again, if they come to themselves and say, hey, I need help, okay? Uh, very important point here. If your loved one has done self-harm or considering to do so, uh, you need to take immediate action and take the person to the hospital or call for emergency help, okay? Anytime a person uh, is thinking about bringing self-harm to themselves or anyone else, um, then it's time to reach out for professional help. So, so, but here, don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, when you do find uh, the mental health professional that matches whatever uh, condition that you are in or your loved one is in, whether it's stage one, two, three, or four, uh, find the right, the right match. Um, finding the, rat, the right match is crucial uh, to establishing a good relationship and getting the most out of your treatment. Um, and again, we can look at the spiritual perspective. Uh, when I finally had to get to that emergency room, I actually did pray. And I said, Lord, please, I really want the right doctor here. Um, and I also said, Lord, I don't want to be in here too long. I, I just want to want to get this situated. I didn't, I, I wasn't thinking, I, I wasn't thinking properly. I just thought I was doing the right thing. And God actually did answer my prayer. 
And the doctor was able to diagnose it, give me what I needed, and sent, sent me on my way. We, I think those of us who have been in an emergency room know how long it, it can take in the emergency room. Um, and I guess when I went in there, when they looked at um, the healthcare provider at the desk, looked at my condition, um, they didn't know whether it was a stroke. And anytime you talk about the heart, um, they usually take you in right away because they, they want to make sure that there is no internal damages going on. And so when I mentioned stroke, I was able to go in much quicker than I would have had it been another type of condition. So, so don't hesitate to ask a lot of questions and find the right, right match. As people of God, we can, we can pray and God will answer our prayers when it comes to trying to find the right mental health professional. I wanna move on quickly to children, children and mental health. Um, children, children deal with mental health. Um, and here are some of the common disorders among children anxiety disorder, eating disorder. Um, it becomes a disorder, remember, when it's persistent and when it's consistent. Um, anxiety is persistent fear, persistent anxiety that disrupts their ability to participate, that disrupts their ability to, to learn appropriately, that is, disrupts their ability to engage in age-appropriate social situations um, with classmates. Um, eating disorders can result in emotional and social dysfunctioning and life-threatening physical complications in children. Depression can happen in children and other mood disorders that a lot of times we tend to ignore. Okay? Persistent feelings of sadness. It's the same, uh, same type of, of symptoms, as you can see, that happens in adults Children can have those same type of systems, uh, symptoms. And, and getting down to that last point there where it says between the ages of five and nine, um, children can begin to experience emotions just like adults. Children begin to experience grief just like adults. Children can uh, suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. Post-traumatic stress disorder, again, is a prolonged emotional distress, anxiety, or distressing memory, or any other traumatic event. And we all know that the COVID-19 uh, presented a traumatic event for children. And in many cases, we've ignored it because they were children, okay? A lot of times we ignore a child's mood disorders. We'll say, get over it. We'll say, what's the matter with you? Well, you know, as adults, we, we don't look into the fact that they are persistently feeling this sadness and this lost interest. And a child's ability to function and interact is disrupted by some type of mood disorder. And sometimes we tend to ignore that because they're young, because they're children, we think that they are resilient to these common disorders that can affect their mental health. So here's some, here are some of the warning signs uh, when it comes to children's mental health. Again, this whole idea of persistent sadness, something that, that, that goes on beyond two weeks in children um, can lead to uh, some type of mental condition that can lead to, to a mental disorder. A mental, or a mental disorder or mental illness, uh, withdrawing from or avoiding social interactions, hurting oneself or talking about hurting themselves. Um, these are all warning signs um, of a mental condition that could lead to a mental disorder. Uh, talking about death or suicide, um, studies show that adolescents usually have a hard time with dealing with the transition from being uh, a young child and now transitioning into a child. And adolescents statistically uh, talk about suicide or death because that transition, um, it, it's hard for them because now they're beginning to grow, they're beginning to blossom. And uh, a, a lot of changes are happening to their physical body. And if they don't have the support systems 
to, to help them, um, it, it could lead to suicidal ideation, um, outbursts or extreme irritability. Uh, when it is consistent, that child is having some type of mental uh, condition that could lead to a mental illness, out of control behavior uh, that can be harmful. Uh, children during um, the, the COVID season uh, don't understand the whole, this whole idea of wearing a mask or um, they, they don't understand this whole idea of trying to stay safe or, you know, you got to wash the cans down when you bring in the groceries or, you know, you have to, to make sure that you social distance. And so in, in some ways, um, not, only, not only dealing with the part of just growing up um, and, and trying to socialize themselves with their friends, now they have to deal with something called a COVID-19 virus. And in some ways, children may even act out. Uh, they may, there may be outbursts. There may be extreme irritability, um, but not even not even extreme irritability. Just irritability from a normal sense of the abnormal things that have been happening. And so, as adults, as parents and caregivers, um, these are some things we're going to have to understand. Um, if a child is showing any of these signs, it it could be some. There could be something going on. It could be a mental condition. Um, during the COVID, children showing these signs should have detected to us that they are going through something that they just don't understand, which means that we have to be more reasonable and we have to be more understanding and patient with them so that what they were going through with COVID will not lead them to any type of mental condition, okay? Loss of weight, difficulty sleeping or concentrated, frequent headaches and stomach aches. All of these things that children are going through are some of the similar symptoms that adults go through and, and really have to be looked at and paid attention to so that we can get them the proper help that they need. How do we help? How do we help or how can I help my child? Should I suspect? a mental health condition, okay? The first thing you need to do is to consult with that child's health care provider. That is the first thing. Um, the, the health care provider, the PCP or the pediatrician knows your child, okay? And before you do anything, um, you should call that doctor and explain to that doctor what's going on with your child. The, the teachers, um, if that child is in school, um, should also be asked, have you noticed anything different about my child? Uh, have you noticed any changes relative to their behavior? Uh, or other caregivers, uh, daycares for, for children who are not in school, babies, 10-month-olds, uh, one-year-olds, three-year-olds. Those children also experience what we call post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, your child's health care provider may recommend an evaluation by a specialist, or that child's uh, health care provider may recommend that you bring the child in so that he first can evaluate the health condition. Um, and then from there, if need be, they will... Uh, do a referral to a psychiatrist or a social worker or a psychologist. But, but here's the key thing. What we must understand is that in, in our role as parents, as, as um, uh, caregivers, as uh, child care workers, um, as teachers, um, those of us who work in daycare uh, centers, you are at the forefront, forefront and you are an in and play an important role in supporting that child. Children feed off of who they look up to. And if you're showing anxiety and nervousness, that child is going to pick that up. Now, we may, we may know how to control it, but the child does not have that kind of mental control. And so they may act out in ways that are different from what we've noticed. And if we're not careful, we may find ourselves 
inadvertently going after that child in a way that we should not, not recognizing that that child is experiencing some type of mental health condition. A lot of it, um, sadly, a lot of it during the COVID season comes from the home. The child sees and goes through what he sees the parent is going through. And if we're showing a lot of uh, pessimism, frustration, uh, overreacting, then that child is going to pick that up. And so, so the parents play an important role in supporting that child and making sure that child gets through his experiences, traumatic experiences, and comes out normal and successful and maintaining uh, their mental health, okay? So, so parents, it's important that we take care of ourselves first, caregivers, teachers. It's important that you take care of yourself first before you can care for that child. If you're not taking care of yourself, uh, the child again will pick up on that and could experience some of the same type of mental health conditions that you're experiencing. Okay. So, so here's what we need to do in order for children to have good mental health, especially during this post, uh, post pandemic or endemic season that we're in. We need to show unconditional love uh, to that child. Okay, from the family first, okay? Unconditional love means, of course, that if that child is acting out, you're not going to uh, try to um, uh, go after that child and say things that are um, inappropriate to the child. Um, you're gonna show unconditional love even though that child is acting out because you're understanding that something is going on. And so you're going to, Pay attention, you're going to focus, you're going to monitor uh, that child. Self-confidence and high self-esteem is very important for children. Affirmation and encouragement uh, play a key role in building a child's mental health. And many times uh, children are, are told other things. Two children are spoken to in more negative language. Um, Children are being told things that does not build their, their self-esteem, that does not build their confidence. And, and, and hear this, uh, according to the research, a lot of child abuse, uh, when, we, when we talk about child abuse, 80% of child abuse comes from the biological parents, 80%. And so children, children need to meet affirmation. They need encouragement from the home first, okay? It is from the home where uh, love is built upon. It's from the home where the child begins to establish and begins to have a firm and solid foundation of who they are mentally. And then it, it should filter out to the teacher and to the caregivers and to uh, the, the uh, daycare providers. Uh, the opportunity for children to play with others is important. Now, now let's be clear, we're still in an endemic, so we have to be um, uh, conscious and we have to be aware and we still have to be vigilant about that particular point. But children need to be able to socialize with other children safely. Um, teachers need to be encouraging. Caregivers need to be supportive. And it, again, it is the parents' responsibility to ensure that teachers and caregivers and guidance counselors and school uh, social workers are doing their part to make sure that that child has good mental health. Okay, starts in the home first. Um, and, and we must be careful that that child sees and hears any distortions, any um, negative uh, activity in the home. Children pick up on it. Just because they may be four years old or they may be five years old, uh, uh, that does not mean that they don't understand. They understand that something is not right in that home and it affects their mental state of being in ways that um, I wanna say that 
they're, they're not going to come and say, hey, what, what's going on? Because sometimes they don't have the words to say. And so they'll act out in other ways that maybe we are not used to seeing them act out. But because, uh, because they, they, they respect the authority in the home and because they may not know what to say, if things are not right in the home, they'll act out in other ways. Um, I did have one case uh, where I counseled with an eight-year-old African-American little boy. And there was a lot of going on in the home between the mother and the father, a lot of arguing about domestic responsibilities and paying bills. And this arguing was at one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. The child was hearing all this. And so because he had so much respect for his mother and his father, the way that he acted out was when he took the garbage out, uh, he would go and just, he would get a match and just light the, the, the garbage up and just the flames would just come out outside of the kitchen window. And the mother began to see this and this would happen frequently. And so she brought him in to me and said, well, could you please talk to him. He's having anger management issues. And only to find out after counseling with him that it wasn't him that was the problem. It was the mother and the father and the engagement and the arguing and the bickering in the household that was affecting that child mentally. So many other things were going on that, that was affecting the good mental health of this child so much to the point where I had to finally bring the parents in and say, hey, listen, let me explain to you what's going on with your child. So, so encouragement, affirmation is important. Uh, safe and secure surroundings is important. Children need to feel like they're safe. They need to feel like they're secure. And again, that comes from the home. It comes from the parents. If we're always feeling anxiety, we're always feeling fear, the child picks up on that and it affects their mental health. Appropriate guidance, appropriate discipline, very important. Uh, we should be careful of, of what we call our children. We should not speak negative to them. We should not call them negative names. We should not uh, uh, turn our backs on them when they need us. We, you know, you know, or say, I'll get with you when I'm done uh, cooking dinner or go just sit down and wait. Or, you know how we do sometimes. You know, you know how we do sometimes with our children. We, we need to apply appropriate guidance and, and discipline, especially during this endemic season when we're all trying to get back out into society, we're all trying to go back to what is some semblance of normalcy. Um, children also are trying to understand uh, where, where does my role play now, now that I take off the mask or, you know, what, uh, or they have questions. They have feelings of insecurity. They have feelings of anxiety. And it's up to us to be able to help that child mentally to get through this post-pandemic season. I was watching um, the news this morning and actually it's coming on tonight on 2020. Um, and it's about children and what they experienced during uh, the pandemic. And very quickly, one child uh, was able to express himself and he was an adolescent. He must've been about 12 or 13 years old. And he began to express what he went through during the pandemic. And the main thing he said, the thing that helped him the most was his mother was right there by his side, encouraging him and letting him know that everything was gonna be all right. We're gonna get through this. And then the child just began to break down and cry. And so, so parents are very important. Appropriate guidance and discipline is critical um, to, to the mental health of our children. There, there are consequences. And I think we've all seen the consequences when we fail our children. Okay? Unfortunately, signs are often ignored, as I said before, not met the support systems for the child. Unfortunately, um, it's children are often taken for granted when it comes to mental health. If we go down to point, the last point there, where it says, this is not the result of a particular individual's action, but of a system 
it's the social, it's the society that we're living in that has not really have developed uh, appropriate uh, protocols to support mental health in children. And herein lies, again, the responsibility of parents to make sure that there is a, an appropriate environment in the home to support children when it comes to traumatic experience, whatever the traumatic experience is. I mean, I know that the one we've been dealing with now is this whole idea of getting through uh, the pandemic, which is traumatic, which traumatic for all of us. So if, if we were traumatized, uh, and our lives have been turned upside down. Could you imagine what the child feels? Could you imagine that? Um, to go into the supermarket and to look up and see all these people with masks on at five years old, four years old, and just to stare like they're looking at somebody from outer space. They don't know what's going on. And so it's up to the parents, again, to, to make sure that they educate children so that their thought processes don't fall into an abnormal state. But when, when we do not act, listen to this, when we do not act early to support children, our children, uh, to support young adults, to support adolescents, we, we, we face consequences uh, with the criminal justice system. We face consequences with suicidal ideation. We face consequences of our children leaving the home, dropping out of school, when we don't support uh, their mental health, okay? So, so here we go, here we go again. Early detection is key in dealing with the child's mental health. Now, I wonder sometimes if, if we've allowed that child to get to stage three or stage four, and now we want to blame it on the system or we don't want to take our blame for ourselves. And now, you know, the child is out of control and we don't know what to, to do. Um, but, but moving forward, understand that there are stages and that if you notice that there's something wrong, there's something not right. Sometimes children can't articulate. Something is wrong. Okay? Like we can articulate. I was able to articulate. Um, there's something not right with me. I, I don't like what's happening and it's been going on too long. And sometimes children cannot articulate that, but we as the authority in their lives should be able to detect that and should be able to see early warning signs and then seek out early intervention for our children. So let's move on quickly to, to the post-pandemic. This is where we are now in, in our society. And, and now how do we cope? This is an, another one of the, the questions I was asked uh, a couple of weeks ago in Bible study. How do we cope emotionally, mentally, and of course, spiritually? And, and this, segues, this segues from our informational session, segues into uh, uh, the spiritual part of how do we cope? Okay, listen, let's be clear. This is a new time. This is a new season. None of us have ever done this before, okay? And this is just a reminder to you, to undergird you, to understand that this is a new experience. These are especially new challenges and they're filled with the unknown. They're filled with uh, things that we don't understand, uncertainties that of course make us all anxious. It makes us want to, to question, ask questions. And now we're talking about a new variant, the BA2 variant. And, and Dr. Fauci is unsure of, of what kind of effect it's going to have on society. And so it's a new experience for all of us. And we're all going to go down the history as survivors of the pandemic. And it's normal. Okay, let's be clear, there's, there's no mental illness about feeling anxiety. Um, there's, no, there's no mental illness. You're not going, they're not going crazy uh, when our lives have changed so dramatically. It's a normal feeling 
But if we allow that anxiety to persist, if we allow it to be consistent, it could lead to a mental condition. And so therefore, what do we have to do? We have to accept our feelings, okay? Yes, you have to accept your feelings of anxiety, accept the fact that you're feeling anxiety. Take, take, talk to someone about those feelings, okay? Talk to someone who's gonna be helpful to you about those feelings. Um, talk to someone who's going to reinforce to you that, listen, you're not alone, okay? Every day in my home, we were talking about this, this pandemic. We, we just get it out, we talk about it, and then we would let it go. Then we would move on to something else. The thing we, you don't want to do is to hold on to this anxiety. You don't want to go into isolation and keep all of this bottled up on the inside of you. Because what happens is not only does it begin to affect you mentally, but now it begins to affect you physically. Okay? So, so accept those feelings. Understand that you're not alone. Ask yourself, what, what did you do to stay resilient over the past 24 months? What kept you to this moment? to this now endemic. What are the things that you did in your life? Was it prayer? Was it meditation? Did you eat right? Did you talk to someone? Did you seek out help through your primary care physician? Did you talk to a psychotherapist? What is it that got you to this moment? Meditation is, is a wonderful tool when it comes to dealing with uh, coping. Mindfulness, excellent. Uh, self-care techniques that can help you to increase your focus. When you are intentional about relieving the stress, when you're intentional about doing what is appropriate to keep yourself balanced and not, you know, uh, keep yourself at optimal level because the anxiety is, is there. The anxiety is going to be there. The tension is going to be there. The unknown is there. But what can you do? Okay, what can you be mindful of doing on a consistent basis that will give you better sleep, that will promote the release of the stress that, that we all have had to, to experience over the past 24 months? What can you do? Okay, um, Reflections is uh, a channel. Some of you may listen to it um, at night, especially when you can't sleep, uh, but it comes on from 3.30 a.m. to 5.30 a.m. in the morning, and it is just quiet, Christian, relaxing music, and uh, we've had to do that in my home many times. Just turn on some music, and it just really, you don't see it from a physical perspective, but from a spiritual and from an emotional perspective, your body just begins to relax. As you let go of the stresses, as you let go of the anxiety, as you let go of all the things you heard on the news and allow this relaxing music just to relax you and push you to sleep. Listening to spiritual biblical teaching, dynamic biblical teaching is, is another uh, uh, thing you can do spiritually uh, and be mindful to do it. Um, there have been times where we have been in church all day. Um, there was one Saturday in particular where we got up in the morning at nine o'clock and we turned on virtual church service. Okay. And we were there until four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and we just kept listening to service after service and the anointing that was in that service just came into our homes. It lifted us, it built us up. And we just wanted to hear the next message and the next message and hear the next song and the next praise song. And, and, and just the, just the, the joy and the, the spirit of God that came through the television, it just came into the home. You know, the teaching that we've been getting, you know, Dr. Williamson who's a phenomenal teacher, listening to the teaching, listening to uh, Bible study. These are things that we must do. The key thing is, have you been consistent about it? Or do you do it when you really can't handle it anymore? Let's go. So post-pandemic, coping emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Remember, everybody has their own comfort level. What comforts you is different from what comforts me. 
what you what can get you through the si- a situation is different from what will get me through a situation. Okay, everybody has their own value system. Everybody has their own worldview on how to get through or how to cope emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Learn to embrace uncertainty when it comes to your emotions, when it comes to your mental health. Um, embrace uncertainty. It, it, and the reason why I say embrace it is because it's there. There's no running from it. If you run from it, it can cause you more anxiety because when it finally catches up with you, you're not ready to receive it because you've been running. So embrace the uncertainty. Okay. Um, the latest I heard was when we talk, we've been talking about the Ukrainian war is that a president, not president, well, yeah, I think he is president, Vladimir Putin in Russia is thinking about uh, sending off one of his nuclear weapon, missiles to the United States. Which what means that, okay, not only do we have to wear the mask, if that happens, we have to now put on a, a helmet or a shield. So, okay, so we have to embrace the uncertainty. You don't know, okay? Use your wise mind, not unwise, but use your wise mind to devise a plan, okay? To be proactive, okay? Use your wise mind to say, I'm not going to allow this to affect me. I, I'm a child of God. God is going to protect me. God is going to protect his people. God is going to protect my family. Okay. Use your wise mind when it comes to preparing. Okay. When it comes to being proactive once again, when it comes to early detection, when you find yourself feeling emotionally down or mentally drained or spiritually depleted. Use your wise mind to say, what can I do about this? What kept me this far? Okay. And maybe I can use those things, or yes, I can use those things to take me to the next day. Take it one day at a time. Tomorrow's not promised to any of us, but we have today to enjoy, amen, the blessings of God. Look at uncertainty from a different perspective. Okay. I started looking at the pandemic from a different perspective. I stopped looking at it from a negative, pessimist perspective. And I started looking at the fact that, hey, we've actually been blessed during the pandemic. I've actually been able to save money. Um, I hadn't had to burn a lot of gas in my car. I've actually had the opportunity to teach in the environment. Um, I was able to get certified to do online teaching. There's so many good things that have come out. So look look at it from a different perspective. Instead of looking at the bad, the, the negative, look at the fact that you're still here. There's so many lives that were lost. But there, for some reason, God has left us here. And he's left us here for a reason and he left, left us here for a purpose. Okay? The mission is, for us to fulfill our purpose. Okay, let me just check on my time real quickly. Let me see where I'm at. Okay, let me just move on quickly. So, and continue to follow the rules set by government and health officials. Um, let's let's continue whatever they they say for us to do. Um, that's one of the reasons that kept us here because we did what we were supposed to do according to the mandates. Continue to follow those rules. And and what I'd like to say is I do have as I'm writing this up now. I have worksheets, um, and I know that I'm giving you a lot of information, um, and I have these self-care worksheets. One is called Keeping Your Mind Grounded. Another one is called Feeling Safe. Uh, this one is uh, for children as well as adults, helping your children to feel safe. Another one is your mind and your body, talking to your doctor, um, and the importance of uh, seeking help from your PCP first. And then of course, there's another worksheet. A self, these are all self-care worksheets. There's another one that's called Thinking Ahead. And I do have these in, um, in my database and I'll certainly make sure they get to the appropriate people. If anyone is interested, they're online worksheets or you can print them out and you can do them. And, and these are again, are things that will help us mentally to keep our minds balanced and stable. Um, 
they, these are some essential mental uh, health hygiene tips. Um, they, there was about 76 of these tips that, and I'm not going to go through all of them. Again, um, I can give you the resource. I'm getting ready to get to those resources. And these are just self-care tips in dealing with the COVID-19 aftermath. And this was another concern that was brought up a couple of weeks ago in Bible study. Um, prioritize your sleep. I'll just go through a couple of them. Uh, your mood and immune system is usually built up when you're sleeping. Um, know your personal signs of stress. Um, number six, take a forest bath. A forest bath is just getting out into uh, the environment, getting out into nature and walking and, and just, in, just bathing in the sun and bathing in uh, the trees and, and what nature has to offer to us. Play a game. Um, uh, avoid mindless snacking. Eat intuitively instead. In other words, buy healthy snacks. Okay, because that's one thing we all, I think all of us have picked up the COVID pounds, but avoid just, just eating anything. Think, okay, my, be mindful, be intentional when you go to places like Trader Joe's or Whole Foods or, or Stu Leonard's and buy some healthy snacks, okay? So I buy one coffee for decaf. Enjoy the healing power of baking. This is one that I actually did. Um, I actually learned how to make my own Chinese food. Um, I actually, um, I, I love to bake. And so I actually was able to make homemade, I don't know if any of you like carrot cakes, but I, I made homemade carrot cakes. Um, I mean, from all organic um, ingredients. Uh, so, so enjoy the healing power of baking. And, and then what we did was, you know, I, I sent it off to my children and they, you know, texted to them and, and actually got my son, my oldest son, who's a musician, and got him into cooking. Uh, since he had to be home alone, now he said, well, now I'm going to start cooking and eating more healthy. Okay, reach for a high protein snack when you need an energy boost. Instead of reaching for Mr. Good Bar or a Snicker Bar or Almond Joy, uh, reach for something more healthy. This, All of this helps. To, to, to build your, your, your mood, make you feel better physically. Let's, let's move on quickly. Um, cook yourself a nutritious meal. Um, and, and I think we all know about nutrition and I'm, I'm not gonna go there, but we, we all practice kindness and gratitude. Uh, it, it helps to, to boost and make you a happy person. Um, Relax to a good audio book or stand up and just stretch. Um, let me see what else can we do here. Let's let's move on quickly. Move on quickly. I put in 35 of the 76 self-care uh, tips. Uh, call a friend or a family member. Social connect social connection can do wonders for your mental health. Uh, one of the things my family did was they put together a, a text string of about maybe about 15 or 17 or 18 of us. And so one text message goes to everybody and just to keep everybody informed on whatever is going on. Um, avoid nonstop news consumption, very important. Um, and we had to stop doing that. We, never, we, started, we started watching the Food Network. Uh, we started again, watching more uh, uh, concerts and praise uh, music and, church services. And uh, one night we went to a, a, a CC whining concert virtually, um, going to services, again, dynamic spirit filled services uh, in Chicago. And we also went to, uh, we also went to Georgia um, and, and looking at watching these services and, 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 and just really gleaning uh, music. My husband listens to music and cleaning music where we can bring and share with the ministries that, that we've been supporting. Um, uh, so, so avoid that nonstop uh, news consumption. One of the other things we did was on our anniversary during the pandemic, we actually took a virtual vacation, believe it or not. We took a virtual vacation, we went to Hawaii. We took pictures, I cooked a Hawaiian dinner for my husband for our, our anniversary. 
And we, we took the pictures and we sent it to our children. They got kind of angry with us because they really thought we got on the plane. Like, how dare you guys get on the plane? They didn't know how to really tell us they were angry. So one of my sons just broke out and he says, mom, I can't believe you guys went on a plane. I went to Hawaii during the pandemic. And I said, no, we, we actually took a virtual vacation. And it, it was fun. It, I mean, so, so you have to avoid sometimes watching this, con- this news, uh, consistent bad news, consistent news that, that, that raises your level of anxiety. Uh, 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 so here, again, are some helpful tips. Um, again, if anyone needs these, I'll make sure that you get them. Um, and, and so as I, as I we're moving towards closure here, um, these are some, now that we're into the spring, uh, let's do some spring cleaning. Let's start with our minds. Let's spring clean our mind, the, 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 the junk, the, the clutter, the, the, the nonsense, the, the, the hmm, some things that are not, not positive that you've been holding on to in your mind. Let it go. When God wakes you up, it's a brand new day, brand new mercies. Um, great is his faithfulness to us when he wakes us up in the morning. Let go of, of all of the things that are not like God, let go of all of the things that seems to make you angry or seems to raise your stress level. Treat yourself sometimes. Eat healthy. Uh, focus on your growth. Spend some time in the sun. The sun is a, is a good source of vitamin D3. Uh, create, again, a nourishing morning routine for yourselves. One of the things I do in the morning, believe it or not, is I jump rope. Um, you know, to keep my heart pumping. I, you know, every day I, and, and, and at first, when I started, I, I couldn't get through a few jumps, but now I'm able to jump consistently because I was consistent at it. Um, spring clean your home. I'm actually now putting a list together to, to spring clean my home because I'm in the home. So, you know, I'm going to do some things to, to get ready for, for, the, for the nice weather that's in front of us. Do something that you love to do. Um, most of all, love who you are. The past is over. Let it go. Let go of the past, go outside, feel good about, about yourselves and, and who you are as people of, of God. Uh, and, and here we go, here we go. And if the, if the midnight comes, uh, and the midnight will come, uh, here are just some foundational scriptures uh, that you can uh, con- consistently uh, keep before you. Uh, let it become a part of your life. You know, let the word of God dwell in you richly. Uh, let the word of God be a light unto your feet and, and, and to your pathway. Set your mind on things that are above and not things that are on the earth. Yes, we think about it, but always think about heaven and what's happening. Think about the scripture uh, in Matthew 24 that says, you know, when we see all these things happening, wars and rumors of war, when we see, you know, earthquakes in diverse places, when we see hurricanes in places that we did not we didn't think we would see a hurricane in. The scripture says that as people of God, we have to look up because our redemption draweth nigh. Let the words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart be acceptable in his sight. Let God be pleased with what you say. Again, these are just some foundational scriptures because will the midnight come? Of course, it's going to come again. Of course, there's going to be another challenge, but know that you are more than a conqueror through him who loved you. And you should know now, or we should know that we are conquerors because we got through, we got through this, this situation. The storm is over. And now we're going downhill with it, which says that we are not just conquerors, but we are more than conquerors. And then this other scripture here in Romans 8 and 5 says, for those, again, who live according to the flesh, set their minds on things of the flesh. Those who live according to the spirit, set their minds on the things of the spirit. And so you must ask yourselves, what are you thinking about? What's on your mind? What's on your mind? Have some more insights. And so therefore, prepare your minds for action. In other words, we must be doers of God's word and not just faithful. We've been faithful to hearing God's word. We've been faithful to to study in God's word, but are we really doers of God's word? Are we really standing on the faith that we've been studying about for years? 
Do we have a sober spirit? Is our hope fixed on the grace that God has given to us through Jesus Christ? And so we, we've got to let this mind be in us the same mind because we all, we all have the spirit of Christ in us. And so therefore, we have to let this mind be in us, which is also in Christ Jesus. And again, we, we must remember these. When the midnight comes, there's some insights for midnight. When the midnight comes around, let the word of God come forward in you. Let the word of God come forward for that issue, for that situation. And I guarantee you, he's going to give you some insights. He's going to give you what you need to do, who you need to contact. He will give you the doctor that you need to get to, to for the situation that you're dealing with or the situation that your loved one is dealing with. God will give you direction. When you keep your mind on him, people of God, I'm a witness that he'll keep you in perfect peace because your heart safely trusts in him. Now, if you're not in peace and you have to take a look at yourself, you have to look at yourself first and you have to say to yourselves, what am I thinking about? What has captured my peace when I can't keep my mind on him? And lastly, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just and pure. Whatsoever things are lovely, if, if there be anything praiseworthy, if there be anything that we need to be thinking about, we need to be, as people of God, we need to be thinking on these things. Now, now do we get off track? Of course we do. But you need to bring it back around, bring your mind back to the word of God and what the word of God has said that we need to do, okay? And we need to take this word of God and put action to it. As I forestated from the very beginning, if there's ever time, as we close, if there's ever time that we need to put our faith to action, it is now. As people of God, people are looking to you. You are a city that is set on a hill that can't be hid. You are a light in the dark places, people of God. And people are in darkness looking for hope. They're looking for the light of the world. And we are the lights that the darkness is looking for. And we must consistently be that light. And in order for our mental health to be stable, in order for us to have good mental health, the key is consistency. You have to be consistent. If you're not consistent, this is not going to work. And you're going to find yourself in a mental health condition that could lead to a mental illness. Think about it. This is a group exercise, and, and I'm not going to ask you to write anything down. Um, we're, we're closing, but I just want you to fill in the blanks. And it's, I want you to, to use your muscle mind, the, the muscle that you have, and think about what happens when. Now, now you have to fill that in. Um, you, you have to fill that part in. But what, what happens when? Okay. For instance, what would have happened? What would have happened if I didn't go to the doctor? If I didn't call my doctor, if I didn't talk to my husband and say, hey, something is not right here. What do you think would have happened to me? If I didn't think to reach out for help, what would have happened? What, what happens when you don't think before you speak? What happens? Somebody gets wounded. And that wound stays with them for a long, long time. But what happens when, when you don't plan ahead? Think about that. Okay? When you say the wrong words to a child, to an adolescent, that child is wounded for a long, long time. Uh, think about it when you say the wrong things or the wrong words to your spouse or to your coworkers, to your friends, to your supervisor. What happens if that happens? Think about what would happen if, um, if you just left the pot on. You didn't turn the fire off. You left the iron going. Okay. If you, if you let, the, let the space heater go in your house, it could burn the house down. Think about what happens when you don't think 
before you act. Think about what happens when, when you don't do things early. The repercussion, the unnecessary anxiety, the unnecessary stress, unnecessary nervousness, the impact on the mind and the body and the spirit when you don't plan ahead. Okay. Think about when, if, if you just, I don't know, maybe you put dirty dishes with clean dishes or dirty clothes with clean clothes. Think about what happens when that happens. Think about what, what happens when you wait to the, to the last minute to get a project done on time, okay? Think about the mental stress that leads to physical sickness. You, you fill in the blanks. You all have your what happens when. I don't think first. And the key thing again is, if we're going to have good mental health, the key thing is we have to be consistent about what we're going to do. And so here's just some powerful words. Believe in yourself. Believe you can and you will. Stay strong. Dream, believe, achieve, never give up. Okay? A little progress each day adds up to a big result. Be grateful. A grateful heart is a magnet for miracles. Work hard. Good things come to those who hustle. Stay humble. Work hard in silence. Let success make those noise. Be kind. Kindness makes you the most beautiful person in the world. And keep smiling. Because if you smile, you make life beautiful. Amen. And you make the world around you and you make the people around you feel good as well. And so here's some resources. Um, number one, uh, once again, uh, the first step is to talk to your doctor uh, who may recommend some physical checkup first. Um, and if they find out that there's some underlying physical or mental condition um, that's causing mental health symptoms, um, they will refer you. Uh, contact a minister or a spiritual leader. We cannot forget uh, that we are people of God and we are faith community. Um, so reach out for help. Don't, don't try to go this journey alone. Pastors uh, are counselors who offer integrated religious and spiritual approaches to treatment. Uh, your doctors will refer you to a psychiatrist or a, or a psychotherapist. Um, and here are some other resources. I won't go through all of them. Um, the one here on depression, that, that particular site we talked about last week, the BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C, at the bottom of your screen, that is a site actually for uh, African-Americans and people of color. Uh, if you're looking for um, someone of color to support you, you can certainly go to that site. Um, and there you will find a wealth of information that can support you. Um, the telehealth is an affordable mental health care online services. Um, you can get help with or without insurance. Um, there are regular virtual calls if you, if you don't wanna go out just yet. Um, there's unlimited online messages. Um, here are some other resources. Note at the bottom of your screen, if, you're, if you are over 65 years old, Medicaid pays 50% of the cost of mental health treatment. And the Medigap insurance will typically um, reverse the remainder um, if you're 65 years and older. Um, and I actually did do some research on the emergency room. We had talked about that last week. And I also found out that um, actually emergency room or the emergency department just within the past, between 2004 to 2016, I believe, recently just started taking in uh, people or individuals who are coming there with mental uh, health conditions. Um, and they will take you in and they will um, actually uh, 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 give you a evaluation. And if need be, they will refer you. Um, and that is most emergency rooms now will do that. Um, I also learned that 44% back in 2006, I believe it was 44% of emergency rooms was taking mental health patients. Um, and in 2016, that percentage went up to 415% uh, of individuals are coming to the emergency room uh, to get mental health treatment. 
415%. So you can see um, that people are dealing with mental health conditions um, in an enormous and impactful way. Um, here are some other resources. These are uh, immediate response resources. Again, I won't go through them uh, one by one, but I will send them out. If anyone is looking for it, I'll make sure it gets to the appropriate people um, at Bethel Baptist Church. And these are other resources. Some of them are 24 hour resources, phone numbers. There's caregiver help at the bottom if you're having problems um, as a caregiver. There's information there for you as well. And then here is a reading resource. I just thought I'd put it in here. If anyone, some of us like to read. This is everyday mindfulness. Um, in, in just minutes a day, you can change uh, that stress state to one of serenity and peace. You have the power to do that. Again, mindfulness is important. To be intentional is important. Mindful meditation is the act, again, of being fully in the present moment, becoming aware and in control of, first of all, your breathing, and then your physical body, and eventually you will control everything around you if you um, just be mindful and be, my, uh, be intentional about making sure that you take care of your mental health. Make sure, um, my brothers and my sisters, make sure, um, make, make sure that your mental health is a priority. You deserve it. You're wonderful people of God, and God has left us here for a reason. And he wants us to be a support mechanism for those who are in darkness and who do not know um, that he is the light of the world and that there are resources in this world that are here to help us with our mental health.